<laughs> Everybody looks around for how to leave. Oh, I forgot. It's two buttons to click. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> Maybe say bye when you've got that leave button ready to go. <laughs> I'm saying everybody the awkwardness. Um, uh, HP, I wanted to ask you, uh, since we're going to be talking uh, once again this evening about Forrest Gump. Uh, <laughs> that's, see, that's I, I got to go. An hour. <laughs> since we're now. No, God, we're not talking. Wait, about. No, 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 no. In all seriousness, we're talking about Lal Singh Chada, right? We're not talking about Forrest <laughs> yeah, Gump. Oh, right. We're talking about the Indian version of Forrest Gump, which is so much better yeah uh, it's such a such a grand experience for everyone uh it was epic yeah um wait were you the only one that was on that episode with me oh, it was, was me and father Malone. okay no it was, it was the three of us okay i didn't uh, mike and heather were the ones who made the wise choice to not show up for that one i could i couldn't i couldn't bear to see my amir khan wow. like that i couldn't do it i couldn't well, do it I, I almost feel the same way about this movie. I just couldn't help but watch Chevy Chase be in something that's not good. Oh, wait, that's pretty much Chevy Chase's entire career. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's not true. I mean, after I was, you didn't let me finish. After oh. like, after 89 <laughs> is more what I was getting at. Like, Chevy Chase in the 80s, it hits a little different than Chevy Chase in the 90s. That's all. I'm, and Chevy Chase in the 70s, but Chevy Chase post like 89. What are we talking about that Chevy Chase made post 89 that anybody likes? Community. That's Memoirs of an Invisible Man. I mean, okay, Father Malone, I figured you would say that, but that's okay. I, I will give you that. It's not terrible. But like, we're, I mean, my point is Chevy Chase is known for a certain time and place as a comedian. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sure. He was, sure, he, but he was past the, the, his, his expiration date was up by 88. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. And I love Fletch Lives, and that came out in the 90s, so I got no fucking room to talk, period. Uh, but hey, it's the Culture Cast. I'm your host, Chris Stasher, and I'm joined by some friends of mine. Let's uh, let's start with Heather Drain from MondoHeather.com and also Noise Junkies. Hello, hello. And I, I, I hear a rumor that some of my uh, my brothers are with this that you, you guys already heard, so spoiler out. It's a Noise Junkies takeover tonight. It's true. Uh, also joining us from Noise Junkies, your friend and mine. Uh, he's not IBM. He's HP. <laughs> Woo. Feeling groovy tonight, Chris. Good to see you. <laughs> and uh, he's the guy who programmed this month. Your friend and mine. I've never seen any of the movies this month, but he has. Your friend and mine. You've never seen his own Father Malone. I'm in the driver's seat. I'm running the show. I'm the fucking president. <laughs> That's my favorite line. Like, how did you know? The best part of the movie. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and you know what, Father Malone? I'm just going to say it. I'm glad these aren't Elvis movies. Oh, you just hush. What, what was it? What was it last year? What was it last year? <laughs> yeah, boy, isn't that great? I have no idea. It was uh, probably a, an actor or something. Oh, no, 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 no. How could we all forget? That was the first time I met HP. And that was when uh, we came up with all those funny porn names because they were all those movies about the, as they say in those movies, the fags. Because there were a lot of college and high school movies oh, yeah. where they were saying that oh, word a whole lot. You didn't have it help us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah it, was oh. a, it was a month of prep school movies last year. Yeah. yeah. Up has the it, Academy. Oh, how did, my heart. Like, that's just... <laughs> Up the Ass Academy, I believe, was one of our porn parody titles. I still, I'm still trying to remember. We had one that we, it, it's legend, but none of us can remember what I specifically said. It, it involves something, something, colon, something, something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember what it was either, but, uh, you know, we, we'll get to that when we'll get to it. But on this episode of the Culture Cast, like Father Malone mentioned, he is in the driver's seat, folks, because it is You've Never Seen September, and we're going to be talking all about what, Father Malone? Tell us what we're going to be talking about. A very rare and radiant subset of films, the sketch comedy movies. This is technically sketch comedy September. There are, there are only really a handful of these uh, that are just unrelated sketches in cinematic form that were released in theaters. And uh, uh, the granddaddy of them all is, uh, is definitely the one we're talking about tonight, The Groove Tube. You sure it's not movie 43? Shut up. <laughs> wow. I, oh, I mean, I mean that I don't know, like I feel like that's the one that most people have heard of if they've heard of any of these sketch comedy movies only because of the visibility of the people that were in it at the time. That makes me so incredibly sad to hear I know, you say that. I know. I know, but to your point, this kind of movie does not exist 
now. I mean, it's 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 a rarity. It was a rarity. I mean, it's a rarity. Period. Wait, way to bring in. the broom down, Jesus! Like <laughs> I know. Yeah, this is this is also um, antidepressant uh, month for some of us. <laughs> well, you know, I, I actually I have a theory about that, Chris. I actually been thinking about that the fact that we don't see any sketch comedy movies anymore like this, and I think part of it is. Because with social media, with with apps like TikTok, um, everybody, you can just make your own little sketch comedy show on your phone just by wa- stringing together five or six little, you know, soundbite worthy segments. I don't know. Maybe that's just my theory, but it feels like, you know, we've kind of people have evolved past that in a way. Yeah, I feel like it would be hard for me to justify going and seeing a movie that's an hour and a half long when you can watch Saturday Night Live. Like it's. And, you know, like, that's the thing, like, that's that I would say is the preeminent sketch anything right now and has been for a very long time. And I know, Father Malone, you're a huge fan of SNL as well. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And this movie uh, predates that and has one of their cast members in uh, Chevy Chase. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, look, Saturday Night Live's been kicking around. It'll be 50 years in two years. Um, So. And uh, there really is, every once in a while, somebody will throw out a sketch comedy show. You know what? I'm not going to say that there's no point in doing sketch comedy shows because I keep seeing newer and newer ones, and I think they're all still really good. There are always good sketch comedy troops coming up in the world. But uh, as far as getting on the air and going up against, it's really hard to compete with Saturday Night Live as far as visibility goes. Um, but, you know, like this came out in 74, and, you know, the history of this movie is that. Chevy Chase and um, uh, Ken, was Ken Shapiro, the, mm-hmm. the 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 writer director in this movie. Uh, they were in a like a comedy troupe. They like, had a theater, uh, like a theater one, I think it was called. And they started filming little sketches to play on video monitors uh, when people would come to see it, and then they would gauge which ones people were really responding to, and then they eventually went and refilmed all of the funniest ones and turned it into this movie. Kind of what what, um, Monty Python did with And Now for Something Completely Different. Those were all like tried and true sketches from the show, and then they just refilmed it, and they threw it into theaters to make a quick buck. Yeah, that's, um, God, you just made my heart happy invoking uh, Monty Python with that. That was that was so good. Now, I, I find it fascinating to think about why we, we don't see these kind of films. But the thing is, like, it is like, I think TV and stage have always taken precedent on that. Also, like, the fuel for a lot of sketch comedy is stuff that's very much of its era. And that's a little harder to translate, I think, in a film. Because film what's that there's something you can visit and visit and visit like think about it. we revisited this film that originally was released in 1974 like that's and that's so cool you know but there's also going to be things in this film and a lot of these films like that that for a lot of people are going to be like they're not going to get it because it's it's making fun of something that was topical at the time and i'm not talking like politics i'm talking like advertising mm-hmm. you know uh yeah because and i would say I, I would say the the the, the majority. I, I mean, my experience. This is a movie I, I've been looking forward to seeing this movie for a long, long time. I'm I'm a big like Father Malone and and probably uh, the rest of us. I, I'm a big fan of sort of counterculture humor of the '60s and '70s. We talked about you know uh, National Lampoon, Fire Sign Theater, um, mm. groups like that. But so I I was really excited to see this. But to your point, Heather, what you're exactly saying is a lot of this doesn't translate to a modern audience because these sort of sacred cows that they're taking on, it's either been done to death in the decades since this movie came out, or a lot of the targets have just aged themselves out of uh, memory, if you will. You know, like a lot of the commercial parodies, who's heard of a lot of these? Like um, you know, Geritol. <laughs> Is Geritol really? Every, are they even like sold anymore in drugstores? Things like that. So... Not I was a little Geritol, but like a very specific ad Geritol was doing. Like the 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 phone book ad is the very specific ad they're parodying. Like you would have to have been around in '73 to know what the fuck they're talking about. I think we do uh, because I'm, or at least I do because I'm an old man, and and 
you Both know, of the, us. <laughs> you guys are old. Please. <laughs> yes, we are. So some of these commercials lingered on the phrases lingered on and just sort of pop culturally, like in the lexicon. So you would, so you would kind of know what, what the joke was, but my God, he, he shoots specifically at things and I'm sure he's hitting them really hard, but that's 50 years later. I, I, I don't know these things, sir. I, uh, first of all, you guys are old. You'd be old if you were like, well, Heather, don't you remember this brand of aspic that was real popular with the housewives? <laughs> like, True. no, you guys, you guys are old. I, our, our American pop culture in the last 50 to 60 years has accelerated so much faster because we, we've gotten things like, you know, you get television and you get home video and then you get the internet and et cetera, et cetera. So everything just moves a lot faster than it did 50, 60, 70, et cetera, years ago. Um, also, do you think part of it, this is kind of a more like cynical reason before, and I know this is all before we're getting the movie, that part of the reason why this kind of like particular subgenre hasn't really transcended is that whenever a lot of the popular sketch shows have made movies, it's usually tapping into one specific character. <laughs> and I mean, even if for better, for better or for worse, I mean, like with SCTV, which for my money, that's, that is my, my boo, my bae. I love it. I love Saturday Night Live, but Saturday Night Live is patchy because it's been around so long and consistently long too in its defense. But it's literally SC- like The Simpsons at this point. And yeah. done live every yeah. single week. Exactly. But SCTV is my my heart, my soul. I love it. Uh, but I mean, they did Strange Brew, which is based on specific characters. Kids in the Hall, you know, even when they did Brain Candy, it's still kind of set like a traditional film, you know, all the Saturday Night Live movies. I struggled with uh, Brain Candy as a a sketch comedy movie. Could I, could I use it this month and deemed it that that I couldn't, that's too much of a narrative, that flick. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, but I respect, I respect your gumption. I respect your moxie. Try to break it. (laughs) Those examples are, you know, characters that grew out of a, a particular form of sketch comedy, but, when I think of a sketch comedy movie, I'm thinking of, like Father Malone said, like an now for something completely different, an episodic kind of like, like for lack of a better term, like Twilight Zone, the movie, which is a, a series of perhaps disconnected, perhaps connected vignettes that comprise a whole. Whereas something like Strange Brew is is taking that like one specific character set and making it into its own movie. But it's not really episodic in the way that like a Kentucky Fried movie or or this is. Yeah, that's no. That's at least the way I think of it. No, no, I know that. I'm not saying any of those movies are sketch comedies. My point is that I think it's easier for producers to see money being made if you have branded characters attached to a property. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, we're talking about bigger budget movies. They see things as properties. They don't see it as, as film, which is gross. And But that's actually going to something you said earlier, HP, that I love is I do find the whole counterculture era of in, in general with art and, you know, and with comedy too, like very fascinating. Cause you get so many great, like subversive, like just where you get to see comedy get really, truly subversive and just bent and demented. It's like mad magazine is all of a sudden getting into the angel dust a little bit at times. And it's great. Um, <laughs> and I find, I find the, I find the really obscure sketch comedy movies from the seventies really fascinating. And we can get into those later. But uh, if I because uh, we've mentioned Strange Brew a couple of times, uh, here's a here's a digression. Steve DeJarnett wrote the uh, the initial draft of uh, Strange Brew, and then he mm-hmm. took that money and bought back his script Miracle Mile and made that movie on his own. Oh no shit! Oh yeah, that's wow. So Strange Brew, while I think is an okay movie, I adore because it gave me Miracle Mile. But anyway, sketch comedy. <laughs> But host had the dog. I love host head. Have you seen Strange Brew, Chris? Nope. Oh, dude. But I have seen Night at the Roxbury. Oh. <laughs> hey, funny, funny story That's all about you need. That. Chris, you'll appreciate this. Having uh, spent the last month talking about Mickey Rourke, the uh, uh, the the what the Watabi brothers, the, the Butabi the, brothers, Buta- the Butabi <laughs> brothers. That sketch was based on the fact of um, uh, Chris Kattan and Will Ferrell being at a club in Hollywood and seeing a guy basically doing that, bouncing his head like that. And they started making fun of the guy across the way, just sort of mimicking him. And then the guy's friend came over and said, hey, uh, we've got a problem here. And it was Mickey Rourke. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yikes. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Look, he didn't punch him in the fucking face. Oh, yeah. Could have happened. You got a fucking problem here? 
Oh. <laughs> you can imagine him. What accent would he use? Would he be playing his character from A Prayer for the Dying? Or do you think he'd be doing something more akin to uh, Johnny Handsome? I just, I don't know what Mickey Rourke actually sounds like. Amazing. Yeah, that's ultimately it. <laughs> a man of many talents. Anyway. Speaking of a man of many talents, on this episode of the Culture Cast, we are talking about a film from 1974 that does feature Chevy Chase. It's called The Groove Tube. Get ready for the biggest fun party ever. Most hilarious, wildest movie is here. The Groove Tube. But don't just take our word for it. The New York Times said, anyone who ever suffered that Chinese torture known as American television owes it to himself to see The Groove Tube. Playboy called The Groove Tube the most stinging assault on television since it was invented. The San Francisco Chronicle said, The Groove Tube is one of the funniest shows ever. The Saturday Review and Q Magazine called it outrageously funny. See your wildest TV fantasies come true in The Groove Tube. It's really great. I really loved it. Uh, it was funny. It was really good. I thought it was a riot. What's crazy about it? No, I thought it was fantastic. I really liked it. I really liked it a lot. The biggest, most hilarious, wildest movie is here. The Groove Tube. So it's written by Ken Shapiro, Lane Sarason, and Rich Allen. It's directed by Ken Shapiro, and it stars Ken Shapiro, along with Richard Belzer, Chevy Chase, Buzzy Linehart, and a, a bunch of other people, but primarily Ken Shapiro, Richard Belzer, and Chevy Chase. And hey, one of those three, two of those three ain't bad. So maybe bad is not even the word I would use. Uh, Don't you come for my Belzer. I'm just no, no, that I love Richard Belzer. Uh, I, 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 you guys know that Richard Belzer is cousins with Henry Winkler? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, but that's awesome. Yeah. Also, hey, here's another weird thing. Richard Belzer is the first celebrity I saw when I, when I uh, moved to Los Angeles. When I was driving down... Uh, Sunset Boulevard, and he was sitting in a cafe uh, sipping a coffee, and I was like, "Oh my God, Belzer!" Anyway, sorry, I don't mean to keep you like the conversation. That's why we're. I could see Quentin Tarantino and be like, "Yeah, whatever." If I saw Richard Belzer, I would legit mark out. I'd be like, "Holy fuck, it's the Bells!" <laughs> Remember when Hulk Hogan put you in a chokehold? You know, he like used that money. He wanted that lawsuit and and like bought like this estate. Like, it's his Hulk Hogan estate. <laughs> Listen here, brother. I don't like none of that, brother. God. Well, uh, you know, Father Malone, I'll kick it to you first. Groove to why, why are we watching it? You kind of already mentioned that. But uh, tell me a little bit about the first time you saw this movie, what you thought then, and, uh, you know, what you thought now rewatching it for the culture cast. I'm going to ask all three all the same questions, so get yourselves ready. Uh, like most movies, I saw this one too young, but... Uh, did not see this in the theater. This was all kind of a late night movie. This this is a movie that uh, I I I've been obsessed with Saturday Night Live since I can think. Like m one of my earliest, most formative memories is Dan Aykroyd bleeding all over the kitchen as Julia Child in a probably a rerun around like seventy eight or seventy nine of that sketch. But I remember being awake and watching that and everyone like uproariously laughing. And it didn't seem scary, although it should have to. Anyway, so Saturday Night Live has been in my consciousness forever. So I've always been drawn to sort of sketch comedy and sketch performers. And this weird phenomenon of a sketch movie, because there were a few um, by the time I had seen this one. Like Kentucky Fried Movie, was, it was pretty much everywhere um, growing up, thanks to the success of Airplane and the, the later Zucker Abrams Zucker movies. But um, this was one that nobody talked about and I kind of caught it late one night and it was almost as if it didn't happen because there's no internet then and if you didn't know the movie you didn't know the movie there was no resource really to like go look it up and uh but here was a sketch comedy movie with Chevy Chase from Saturday Night Live and it was like all scatological and uh, I think this is the first movie I saw a, uh, a like a, a penis on screen. I think uh, full frontal nudity. This is the, the, the first experience with that. Um, I think the movie is of its time, that uh, uh, that early 70s counterculture comedic scene that was going on. Um, so as you said, HP, like, uh, you know, a lot of these sacred cows have already been obliterated. So rewatching this movie some 40 years on, it's a it's a bit of an odd experience. Like 
most of the jokes don't land if there are jokes there at all. But I still, uh, on a couple of scenes in the, uh, while rewatching it, was brought right back to age you know, 11 or something when I, when I saw the film for the first time. And, and the relevance of the movie sort of uh, struck back home to me, too, that there was nothing like this in 74 when this movie came out. And you have to remember that you know television didn't really sort of come of age until the 50s, and this was the generation that were actually raised by it. And here's sort of the first cinematic attack on television. Saturday Night Live would specialize in satirizing television and television culture because it was everywhere. Um, but uh, this seemed to do it not only first, but harder and meaner. And so that appealed to young me. That looking back at it now, like I said, not a lot of it works, but the intent still shines through. Heather, what about you? Uh, first of all, I loved all of that. Mad respect. And especially, uh, I think we all... Yeah, anybody who grew up watching cable TV, especially, we all have those like memories of when you first see nudity. <laughs> You're like, oh my god, a boob! And then full frontal, that must have blown your mind. Like, oh my god, crap. Yeah, because because when I was what eleven, HBO, what, what, what year is this? Eighty four. We're talking about the, yeah. the idea of even nudity on television was absurd. It it never happened. Like you would need to have paid for the the Playboy Channel or something. Like it. You, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had HBO by then, but you know, you know, it wasn't like it wasn't like you can see on just regular television nowadays. Anyway, I'm sorry. Continue, please. No, no, um, no, and especially as someone who I I I grew up watching SNL as well, and even like reruns, because I, in fact, I remember doing impersonations of um, the the two wild and crazy guys because I love Steve Martin and I love Dan Aykroyd a lot. They were my Two of my favorites and um that was really inappropriate i had a really good track record as a child of quoting things that i look back on now that i, I should not have been doing <laughs> but anywho um i was so glad to be on this episode because this is a movie i've read about for years but i'd never got around to watching it like i've actually seen some of the more like kind of as i alluded to deeper cuts like cracking up the 1977 sketch film, not the Jerry Lewis film that's a few years older. Uh, American Raspberry, uh, The Boob Tube, which I do not recommend <laughs> at all. I do have the big box VHS, and that's beautiful. But that's it. That's don't don't see it. Um, what year? The Boob Tube. Uh, oh, it's definitely 70s. I want to say. I'm just wondering if it predates this movie, and that's why they referred to this movie as the Groove Tube, and or or they were just being groovy. They <laughs> groovy. I it may be around the same time because my gut is 74, 75, 75, 75. So pretty close. Nah. Um, but the Groove Tube um, was attempting attempting to capitalize on, on this, this movie. Yeah, and it has like it even has like have like fake commercials and all that and it's it's not it's not good it's not good <laughs> but um and uh even like there's one called sos screw on screen where screw magazine did their own sort of variation and it's and that's actually really really good because that's wow. I mean, you want to talk about some subversiveness you got to get people like al goldstein who you know put his money where his mouth is and definitely like larry flint did some jail time and dealt with you know legal issues for having for fighting for the first amendment and it doesn't get much more countercultural than that uh so i was like ooh, the groove tube this is the mother this is the the big daddy the big kahuna and um it, it was uh it was it was it was it was i i don't know we'll get into it <laughs> There are things I really, I really enjoyed about it. Uh, there are a few things I think are still really funny. Um, I think it's one of those films I consider it's a, it's better. It's almost like a better historical piece and a better experiment than it is as a wholly successful film. Uh, but, uh, but you know, we can kind of get into the nooks and crannies. It is, it is a trip to see baby, baby Belzer uh, and and baby Chevy Chase. And there's two um, two classic actresses of erotica in this film too. So I'll get into that later. But with Jennifer Wells, right? The, she's yes. the dollar girl. Yeah, she was yeah. born actress. Oh, she's beautiful. Oh, she also like had origins in sexploitation. She was in Joel Reed's Career Bed, which is a really good depressing movie. She's great in that. She's also one of the women on the cover of Are You Experienced? The Jimmy Hendrix album. See, this movie's historic. <laughs> 
<laughs> HP, bring, bring us, bring us yeah. home, my friend. All right. Well, uh, to echo the our, my the previous uh, sort of uh, remembrances, I, I also grew up with the uh, SNL. I, I rem- for me, it was I remember like climbing into my parents' bed uh, late on a Saturday night and like basically falling asleep to SNL. Not not understanding hardly any of the sketches, of course, but but recognizing all the actors and and knowing that it was funny because of the reactions of my parents and and my oldest brother. Uh, but um, but this I, I said earlier, this movie has kind of been on my radar for a, a long, long time. I remember going to the video store back when we had this was before Blockbuster even. And I the, there was a, the video cassette of the Groove Tube. They actually had it at this one place I used to go to called Tri-City Sales. And I the, the, the picture for me was iconic of like the it's sort of like a gorilla with the with the, um, a TV for a head, you know, and. I think at that point I may have already I must have already seen Kentucky Fried Movie. So somehow in my mind, I knew that there was some relation there. I mean, it's loose, but I am sure they're probably just capitalizing on on one another's sort of success, the iconic gorilla. But um, but I always wanted to see it. And uh, it, it was it, it, it was an interesting experience. Like I, I also like we've been all saying it, it, it misses the mark more often then it hits it at least for uh, someone watching it in 2023, uh, you know, some whatever it is, 50 years after it was you know, made. But I also want to echo what everyone else is saying, which is I, I even though I didn't love, you know, the, the movie as a whole, I really appreciated the, the subversive, you know, aspect to it. The fact that they obviously thought, you know, they were making something very sort of subversive and counterculture and uh, attacking all of these sort of norms at the time. I, I, I really dug that. I dug the spirit of it more than I dug the comedy of it, if that makes any sense. But um, but it actually, and it got me excited to, to sort of seek out, I mean, there's a bunch of these types of, of sketch comedy movies that I have yet to see. There's one called Tunnel Vision, which also features Phil Proctor from the Fire Sign Theater. Oh, uh, right. I think um, Joe Flaherty is in that, Elaine Boozler. There's some interesting people in it. And I know there's there's kind of a narrative sort of thread that runs through it, which I guess is is a little more sophisticated than uh, than the Groove Tube. Um, and I'm sure there's many more that that I've yet to discover. But uh, you know, I was excited to watch it. Obviously, uh, you know, the experience was was interesting in, in the modern day. But uh, but yeah, no, I'm, and I'm I'm excited to delve into it a little bit and see what everybody else thought of uh, some of the comedy. Speaking of some of the comedy. <laughs> Very little, let's, let's, let's break it down uh so what's funny is uh you know I, I actually remember downloading this movie a while ago like long ago I, I was scrolling through one of the many websites i go to to watch movies on <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is an audio medium they can't see that i wink uh <laughs> chris winks ladies and gentlemen <laughs> oh oops um but i remember downloading it because actually for for the reason hp said because it had an interesting cover art like it's a gorilla with a um, tv set on its head which is I, I i like monkeys i like gorillas you know and so it seemed like you know in the groove tube interesting name so i've had this sitting on my plex server for couple of years and so when father malone programmed this month and that was one of the movies i was like oh, okay i'll get to finally watch this movie i've literally had sitting on my plex server for a couple years um yeah i mean it's it's fine yeah i think the issue is i i think we've all kind of already said it so just to get out in front of it like the rest of everybody else has some of this is so specific it's hard to really comment on it now like it, it was a parody of a commercial from the 70s if that is if if you don't have a frame of reference for what the commercial is, you have to go and watch the commercial after you watch the movie and then rewatch the movie to understand what they were getting at, which is what I did. I essentially had to go and watch all the ads that they were parroting and then I rewatched the movie so I could understand why they were doing this and what the parody was, which I think is important because, again, it puts it in the context of when this came out so yes in terms of the success that this had in 74 i understand why this was so well regarded why why fucking gene siskel gave it three out of four stars and said it was funny and he enjoyed the directions that it went and the subject material of the movie he he appreciated it but in 2023 (laughs) now 
I mean, some of it is funny because some of it doesn't rely on specific references to specific things. But in, in the same way that like, uh, you know, I, I it, coincidentally enough, I watched Scary Movie 3 over the weekend, which is my favorite of the scary movies. It has Charlie <laughs> Sheen in it doing the hot sh- like like your like, father malone you're attempting to agree with me sorry i was muted yeah i totally agree with you that's my favorite as well i love that one that's uh that's the one with the the, the eight mile parody correct simon simon rex dirt nasty uh yeah. oh my god that there's there's <laughs> one bit in that the yahtzee bit where he he keeps hitting his head on the shelf above him like we were playing a fun game and then uh, yahtzee and then he yeah. knocks him uh, twice great great yeah. stuff and that and that's the thing, like, but there are jokes in that movie that that don't work now because they're specific references to specific things from mid two thousands, whenever Scary Movie three came. Can I can I say something about that? The jokes in that movie and um, there's in Kentucky Fried Movie. It's another movie we're going to be talking about. There is a specific parody of a commercial in that movie uh, as well. The thing is, context is fine, but it's not going to make it funny. Ultimately, the joke has to be funny. Right. In, you'll see what I'm saying in Kentucky Fried mo- Movie, where the joke fucking hits, makes me laugh every fucking time. Doesn't matter that it's a very specific commercial they're parodying. It could or could not be a commercial. Does, doesn't matter. The joke is the joke. And uh, these jokes ultimately aren't that funny in this movie. And that's and that's the problem. I mean, again, you know, Scary Movie 3 has a couple moments where it's specific things like, oh, a Michael Jackson joke. But like the joke is still funny because the joke is funny. And that's the pro- and that is you're right. That is the problem here. This movie is just not funny in a lot of ways. Like it is funny, but it's more clever than it is funny. I think the things that they poke fun at and the ways that they do it are interesting and clever, but like laugh out loud funny like i i laughed i maybe laughed a couple times and the question then becomes is that the measure of a of a successful comedy is how many times i laugh out loud i don't think so it's like how many times am i scared when watching a horror movie and is that the bar by which i measure no not really it's whether or not i enjoyed the experience at least for me of sitting down and watching the movie and would i do it again i think the problem with groove tube is there's too many segments that don't land it's like i mean this is like a microcosm of of tales from the crypt i can't endorse someone go back and watch tales from the crypt because it's a a sketch horror show in a lot of ways like it's an anthology so every episode's different and it with groove tube there are some segments you could watch out of this that are fine but do you need to sit and watch the whole thing that's the problem well as a curiosity the answer is always yes like right as right. a curio, as a document of a time right. and a place, it is worth your time 100%. If you're looking to laugh even once, maybe, I, I don't I don't know if you haven't seen this movie and have no reference for that time and place or love of that time and place, that you're going to get one laugh. And, and that's exactly, that's a great point, Father Malone, where, you know, as a curio, I think it has great value because it really is a time capsule of a very specific place and time. But but part of my problem with the humor is um, and maybe this is just because we've had 50 years to become jaded about comedy and we've seen these essentially the same type of humor coming again and again over this time is a lot of the a lot of the jokes, a lot of the humor. It just seemed like we, I get the point of the joke, but then that segment goes on for another in like it sometimes it feels interminable. But, you know, it's I get it. It's it's a parody of a cooking show. And this person's making a mockery of the kitchen and just making a mess. And it's all nonsense. Well, that I get it. But I don't need, you know, seven minutes of that. Like, I, I, I got the point of it in the first two minutes. Um, you know, it's like that. MTV, it, MTV has rotted your brain. You just brevity need the- is the soul of wit, bro. Shakespeare said it best. It's the truth. Like the the we already mentioned the Dan Aykroyd Julia Child thing. That's a better send up of cooking shows than this is in this movie. Like period. And that's a specific person that they're referencing. And I think it does a better job of encapsulating a certain kind of cooking show from a certain time and place than the cramp TV kitchen does. Because to your point, HP, just like the dealers in wasted segment in this, why does it need to be 15 (laughs) minutes long? The joke wasn't funny in the first minute. It's not going to magically get better in the next six. 
Yeah, it exactly. felt longer. Yeah, I mean, this movie's not even 80 minutes. This is a it's short... So, it, it's it's barely over an hour, 72 minutes. Yeah, it's a short feature, but it drags. And and the thing is, like, the most important thing about comedy is... is to comedy is timing. And when your timing is wonky, there's going to be an issue. I, I will say... I did uh, the opening where they keep looping nature sounds and various nature shots during their whole 2001 thing. That shit kind of made me laugh. I <laughs> re- repetition is a little funny to me sometimes. Um, I'm with you on of, that. I'm with you on that. Yeah. It's like when uh, Mr. Show did their parody of Jesus Christ Superstar with Jeepers Creepers. And they, they, they keep looping that segment with David Cross. Or it's like, <laughs> like, I was on like, because <laughs> I'm too like that's just hilarious. And Mr. Show's another great sketch comedy show, but um I wish they had made a movie. They did. Ron Ronnie Run. Ron Ronnie yeah. Run, baby. Ron, Ron, Ron. Thank yeah. you, Heather. Oh my it's god. A sketch comedy movie. Oh, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. But Ron Ronnie Run gives us Jack Black singing his little chimney sweep song. Was it like kick a cunt? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Run, Ronnie, it's, Run. Oh God, such a great movie. Oh my God, this. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it's if it's in the show or the movie where he talks about having intitulitis. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I suffer from a tit lattice, but uh, sorry, I digress. But uh, but no, if, if that's the thing. There are things attempted in this movie, even that I really liked. I mean, there's like a very experimental film flavor kind of throughout that I that I don't think you really see in the other sketch comedy movies, even even the more obscure ones, like the especially like the animation and like with the you know with the titles kind of intro buildup after you get the 2001 it's like got chroma key and superimpositions and then there's like that whole sort of dream sequence that's animated in the middle of the dealers and i actually looked up because i was so struck by the animation is pat o'neill uh and linda taylor and pat o'neill has more of a filmography but linda's i'm more interested in because her other two credits she did animation for cracking up in tunnel vision so I figured with the, with the theme of this month, I thought that was very cool. Um, That's that, the yeah. best part of that entire segment. Uh, yeah, totally. I love the animation during the, the dealers. It was awesome. That segment is it's, like, it, it, uh, it, uh, like, and it's the one where like, when I watched the movie for the first time, I had the most promise. Cause I was like, it's Richard Belzer and Ken Shapiro on screen. Like, here we go. And then it's just like, it's fucking me. And to, to say it's meandering would be an understatement. It's just the worst part of this entire movie. I think as far as I'm concerned. Every beat but, in it should have been cut by half. I think. Like, uh, yeah, I agree. But the but one of the things half. I kind of one of the things like I I I agree with you there. But one of the things I kind of liked about it is, in a funny way, it reminded me of the fabulous furry freak brothers in the way that it was just kind of this dingy sort of look at these like low level dealers and and like everything. I mean, just watching that segment, I felt like I had to take a shower because it was so you know the, the apartment was so gross looking and dirty and uh but yeah it's it's my favorite part of the of the entire film actually like i i, I think <laughs> chris what you're saying is chris what you're saying is 100 percent true it does not need to be 15 minutes it should have been seven minutes or six minutes and we still could have gotten all of the beats that they're that we we get it's just it's there the jokes are delivered quickly and then interminably unfortunately because i like all of that i like how dingy it is and i like how ramshackle uh, the, the meandering lifestyle of dealers and the bullshit that they have to deal with one of the moments that actually makes me laugh in that movie is when they're driving and the guy says uh, ken shapiro says uh, hey this is funny the cops following us and richard bells is like that's not funny like <laughs> that's not, that's not funny at all like what are you talking about like that was really good and and it has the animation thing, and it has that ending where it just turns into this uh, uh, like a church uh, public service drug film, which a lot of those if you, if you watched a lot of those, uh, which we did as kids, like they just sort of end that way. <laughs> so yeah, I, no, like I agree. Dealers, I like the dealers overall, but like it is way too long. I, I didn't need to see 
more than a few minutes of those guys doing it. Unless they were being more pointed and more narrative driven. Chris's, the look on Chris's face when he said that Father Malone, that was funnier than anything in the dealers. Because <laughs> yeah. you said that and Chris said, like, Chris's eyes went like, oh, God. Like, yeah, like, totally, man. Like, pop it out of his soul. That was I mean, funny. I appreciate the Henry portrait of a serial killer nature of where they live as much as the next guy, but I think I, I think, yeah, like it, it, it slows the movie to a molasses crawl. And look, you know, the it's sandwiched between a an, an ad for butt butt beer <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, and the the bell, the bell walking fingers ad campaign thing, which I mean, look, that for me felt like, as we like to say on Midnight Viewing, and that feels like a blackout sketch. <laughs> it really, it re like any of the commercials all like at least any of the commercials that have that like 15 seconds, they all just feel like a blackout sketch from any of these other like, you know, things that we've talked about anthology wise. And, th- and those are fun and fine, but it's when they kind of try to do a little bit more where they start to stumble because channel one evening news. Why do we sit on Ken Shapiro for like five minutes? Like, oh. why yeah. i just fucking i mean i get the eric andre anti-comedy anti-climax nature of it like i as much as i love tim and eric and eric andre and those kinds of shows i get it and appreciate it but that, that that's not what they're trying to do here that's just the one time that they're doing it and it don't work when they do it the one time well that's the problem is that I mean, I hate to, I'm not trying to speak ill of him. Ken Shapiro is the least funny of like the cast that we see, in my opinion. Like, we know Chevy Chase is funnier. Richard, we know Richard Belzer is funnier. Ken Shapiro is not bad. I'm not dogging on him per se, but I'm just saying we get a lot of him. And I don't think, I mean, Eric Andre, that's a great comparison. Eric Andre is charismatic. Eric Andre oh, yeah. is like, he's also fully committed in like almost a way where it's like, you know, is this a work or is this a shoot? You know, uh, I don't know. It plus- don't sleep on Ken Shapiro. He directed the Modern Problems featuring Chevy Chase, which might be the single most unfunny movie I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I was about to say, the only thing I know about that movie is Chevy Chase has modern problems. Oh, the tubes have... Dabney Goldman. Yeah, that was great, Chris. The tubes have a song on that soundtrack. Saw that in the theater. Damn. Nice. Chris- Christmas Day. Also, you know the tubes, which are obviously one of my favorite rock bands ever as HP and Father Malone know. Now you know, Chris. Uh, they were in Cracking Up. Like, there's even, like, Fee Waybill plays a, a character in it. The band comes out at one point. White Punk's on Dope and Mondo Bondage are used in different sketches. So, for you Tubes fans, just saying. But it, yeah. it all comes back to the Tubes. I love the Tubes. It's, you I know. know. I can't. I can't. And, it, and it, at least it applies, because I'm bad about bringing stuff in in my own way that makes sense only to me. <laughs> so. Here, I'll, here. Yeah, I'll bring but, it back. Because you mentioned that Ken Shapiro is the least funny on screen, and I'm uh-huh. going to I'm going to disagree with you because I think uh, uh, he is he has to carry everything, whether or not um, like a sketch is going to work. Like he there has to be the straight man to to somebody. So so I don't think he's being funny a lot of the time. But I think when he is being funny, he's in character. Coco the clown, regardless <laughs> of the year, is a funny fucking sketch, and yeah. he's really good in that one, and. He, uh, I, I said the the dealers is my favorite sort of sketch overall, but uh, my actual favorite moment is the closing sketch, the the just you just me dance sequence, where it's just him uh, with a cameraman like singing to passersby in New York, and you know uh, just dancing lively and like a like that whole sequence is amazing. That's all Ken Shapiro. That's all improv. It's actual joyousness uh, at the end of the movie. If it didn't have that scene, I don't know that I would re- recommend the movie even as a curio, but that scene is actually worth seeing. So, oh, it, it's, I wanted to defend Ken Shapiro a little No, bit. no. And that's it. I'm not dogging on him, for the record. he That is a charming, and I think that's his best like on-screen thing, in my opinion, is that in sequence. But uh, is it funny? I don't think... It, it's not funny. It's cute. It's cute. Uh, Coco the Clown, I did not like. And not for the obvious reasons. Like, I don't mind some creepy ass clowns. Like, one of my favorite (laughs) Dr. Tobeno songs is Kinko the Clown by Odgan Etzel. And that shit's unsettling and funny. Odgan Etzel is great. 
Um, whoever played uh, the creepy clown on Conan O'Brien that one season where he had like this girl that looked like the little girl from the ring playing a, like like a harmonium. That dude was great. Uh, I just didn't like his Coco the Clown. I also didn't like his ensemble. That was, but I give him points for the ensemble because that was the shittiest clown costume. Those colors, it was all like rusty browns and old blood red and, you know, green. There's like this shitty moss green. It was, uh, it was a total abortion of a clown costume, which I can respect. I can respect. See, but, but I, one of my single favorite moments was in that Coco the Clown sketch where, He's he's reading the erotica to these kids, and then when he realizes he's, he's got to go back on, uh, you know, become Coco again, he like takes one last drag off of the cigarette that he's been sort of surreptitiously smoking, like one last puff, and then he's back to being Coco again. I don't know. I I just thought it was a really funny transition. Uh, that actually that was maybe my my one chuckle during the whole movie. I was like, that's really funny. I don't know. I think I think Father Malone agrees. He's he's chuckling himself. Oh my God! Yeah, it's so well observed. Just the, I, 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 I look. I'm gonna, I'm gonna defend him again. I'm gonna cry poverty for him for the outfit. <laughs> this movie was made for two hundred thousand dollars. Well, no, um, I, but, I'm saying the outfit works for this guy. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I he, when he's portraying the clown television host, uh, he's really going for it uh, to a manic degree, and then settles into this l- laconic creep. <laughs> he's not even a creep. He's like, I think he, he's really just doing good. <laughs> he's, he's, like, he's like Steve, he's like Steve Allen, basically. That's what he's doing. Kind of. Yeah. Like, and you know, he really knows the kids and the kids know him and they want to hear page 47 from Fanny Hill by John Cleland. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. I knew I, when, when the sketch started, I, I, I had a feeling it was going to be a play on the famous like soupy sales thing where he give had, me the money. Put the, he, he had he yeah. told the kids to go to their parents wallets and send him all the pictures of the presidents they found in the wallet. So I knew that it was going to be subversive, but I, I don't know that I was expecting him to read, you know, literary erotica to these children. But and, and to Father Malone's point, like. His demeanor, the way it changes when he's reading, it, it was it's it's very peculiar. I was not prepared for for the, the sort of dichotomy between Coco and this other sort of weird character, but uh, I you know I I liked I probably liked it you know better than I expected to like it. I, I don't I, I I think it went on a little too long. Again, I think a little brevity might have helped, but. Uh, but it was funny. I mean, I, I got a few laughs out of it, I guess. I got no laughs. I, I got agree. none. Zero. <laughs> I Z- agree. I agree Zero. with you, Heather, about yes. Ken Shapiro. Uh, I also, the, so uh, the only segment I liked him in was the Coco segment because, I mean, I, I will agree – Reading erotica is funny. That's it. <laughs> reading <are>. erotica <laughs> is. I mean, we could do a whole podcast where we just read erotica and we could all chortle along. That would so be funny. Think- so you're saying just the his reading of the erotica? Is yeah, it has nothing to do with Ken Shapiro. Part. Like you know, okay. I, I think <laughs> I mean that just reading for me, hearing someone talk about engorged phalluses will never not be funny because people uh, saying it out loud is funny. That's also what, our new podcast, Chris and I are starting. <laughs> engorged phalluses. <laughs> what makes me laugh about that sketch is that these children are writing him letters. That the, you know, this is a. Uh, <laughs> That's how it's happening. I like the idea that maybe they aren't and he's just reading it to them anyways. That's he's just like, I'm going to read children erotica. I think that's no, more it, perverse. It only works if these kids have been watching so long that they have favorite passages from these, from the, like they're thinking back to it. Oh, what was it? Page 47? Did you read that again? <laughs> I, that like, was I, d- I was hoping that we would get to hear what the what, what he was reading from the Marquis de Sade, but. The marquee yeah. is a little bit more my speed, less Fanny Hill, more marquee to stop. <clears throat> yeah, what, what's what's an old French term for a prolapse? Uh, now, it, to HP, HP though, I do love so much that you brought up Soupy Sales because I do love Soupy Sales, and in fact, Soupy Sales had a dance that uh, my friend Stephen sent me a video of, and it was amazing. I think everybody listening goes goes to go check out Soupy Sales. Just because something's old doesn't mean it's not funny. Because there's plenty. The Marx Brothers holds up. God, those guys started vaudeville. And that's like, the thing about this movie. It's like you run the risk of alienating people in the future by being too specific. And Charlie Chaplin and being unfunny. That. <laughs> well, that too. But the Marx Brothers. <laughs> 
Charlie Chaplin. I mean, even, you know, someone like Jackie Chan, like there is a timelessness to what they're doing because it's physical comedy and physical comedy doesn't need a pop culture reference. You know, I mean, look, the let your fingers do it thing is funny with or without the knowing the ad campaign because it's two fingers humping done rather well. But <laughs> and I, I mean, I wonder, like, you know, because like, the, well, let's take the Geritan girl thing, for example. Is that funny without knowing the Geritol ad that it's based on? Yes, boobs. <laughs> well, and Chevy yeah. and Chevy Chase making that face at the end, unable to keep Absolutely. along with the the audio, is funny. No, yeah. I will. Random boobs aren't funny, but Jennifer Wells is so cute in this, and so, the way she shakes her cha chas as she takes, I thought was just so cute. Like she was, she was having fun with it. She was, but it's fun. It's funny, but in a different sense than I think they originally intended. I think if. <laughs> In, in its time and place, when the Geritol ads were, were prominent, I think it, it it tickled you for a different reason. Now it's just more about the outrageousness of seeing a woman, you know, doing what she's doing and, and Chevy Chase being sort of mugging. But it's not funny in the sense of being a parody of Geritol. That's that's my opinion. But it is. Here's the thing. It is a very pointed ad because the, 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 the tagline on the old Geritol ad was my wife. I think I'll keep her. And it was your that's wife. That's the is using actual Geritol. ad campaign. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. It, not, no, great. Ger- Geritol's <laughs> not not great. No, no. no. Actually, real bad. Ger- Geritol. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, Geritol. <laughs> The fuck! I just the, the, it's it sounds it sounds like a drug that old people take. I legit thought it was for like constipation. What, Geriatric. What is not, I mean, geritol. What is geritol? What is geritol for? Is his wife incontinent? Is she is she backed up? It's just a supplement. That's it. Yeah, yeah just a vitamin. Just a vitamin supplement. Yeah. Oh, for oh, iron God, poor this. tired blood. That's oh, what it was a, a fix for. I. Uh, you know what? This you is can like, still you- buy it. You can still buy it. Let's go get I, us some bottles of Geritol, folks, and take a ride to Sex uh, Town with Chevy Chase. You know, you know what a great uh, pop culture reference ad that even though the product and the advertisement people won't remember, because honestly, I this was a little bit before my time slightly. But do you guys remember from the 70s era SNL where they had the the bottled water with the waters of the Lake Erie? Oh, and yeah. set to Carly Simon's anticipation. And it's like this just nasty sludge yeah, that yeah. shit's still funny and i remember seeing that as a little kid laughing and i didn't get i didn't get the actual reference but i mean it was done funny like it was so funny just the way it was done it was so out of the box and you know i just i don't know i mean homie the clown's funnier than coco i'm sorry i can't get past this <laughs> like i love homie the clown <laughs> You know, uh, here's the thing: like, it doesn't even have to be it doesn't have to be advertising necessarily. Airplane has a moment that's a parody of "From Here to Eternity." I, I, I defy anyone who's coming to Airplane for the first time now to have seen that film and know the reference. Well, they but reference a, a coffee ad in in Airplane that like doesn't work if you don't know the coffee, right? Like, that's right. Yeah, he only he, never t- he doesn't take. Coffee. Yeah, yeah. And like what and like that that joke, we talked about it on the police squad episode or the police squad show that we did, Mark Begley and Mike White and I earlier this year. We talked about that. Where it's like this doesn't land so, anymore. Like you have to know this right, so that's his joke. That's those guys demonstrating both types, right? Like you can do a topical joke, but if the joke is funny, it's good. And the other one is just a joke about the line that they've been hearing in ads. Right. Which the Geritol thing is. I mean, they literally just quote the ad. It's basically the family guy of comedy. Hey, here's a reference. You recognize this thing, so that's funny. Remember when X did Y? The family guy equation. Uh, I mean... uh, You know, speaking of X... As in the band, no, I can't. I, I can't connect the punk rock band X to this, but I do want to bring up the music because this film, and I think this is one of my favorite things of it. It has that main song by Curtis Mayfield. Move on up, it, yeah. Yes, I was it's like, fantastic. I was, oh, I was so, so shocked because, well, I don't know. I, 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 maybe this is in the time before filmmakers had to pay through the nose to have songs like that in their movies. But I, that when I heard that start up during the sort of the hitchhiker scene, I was like. Oh, this might be really kind of cool. I love this song. I love Curtis Mayfield. But again, it was kind of a, a bit of a bait and switch because it doesn't really it doesn't really have any real bearing, I think, on that particular vignette. And uh, it just got me ex- unreasonably excited for the movie 
and the expectations couldn't possibly be met, be met at that point. But uh, but it was but it was I agree that was really cool to hear that. Is that the hitchhiker sequence? That that's yes. where it first comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, I I also well, it, liked it's I perfectly liked the hitchhiker. placed it because it. So go ahead. It's perfectly placed because it defied your expectations, just like that hitchhiker. He, that song made you the hitchhiker. You were like, oh, this is going to be great, and then oh, there's cops. There you go. I, I also liked that the hitchhiker looked like Jamie Gum from Silence of the Lambs, <laughs> and it kind of, I don't know. I, I was expecting him to do like the tuck dance or something, but uh, and yes, I'm aware of the was, was, was fucking burst. Buzzy, Buzzy <laughs> Langhart, who was a soundtrack guy, but he, he just looked like Jamie Gum to me. I don't know. He but, did. Uh, he really did. And then oh his pants God. come off, and he's just cock flapping in the wind. <laughs> I, I do appreciate the nudity in this movie. I appreciate a good dick in the wind, folks. Who doesn't? All, all we are are dicks in <laughs> dicks the wind. In the wind, man. Is that uh, the, the, the demo? <laughs> <laughs> we really gotta change the wording here, guys, because I don't think they'll let us play "Dicks in the Wind" on the radio. Man, <laughs> it might have been I, an even bigger hit. <laughs> it's a, it's the it's Jamie Gump. I'm my heart, my soul. I in my original notes, I had guy, guy guy with burgeoning skullet so you did a lot better than me hp i looked up I love that term skullet that's great I, it's, it's like it's so perfect and it's so rare the person that can rock the skullet so far i've only come up with um the uh R- richard o'brien true so uh Reggie and then Bannister. there's that guy and then there's like that uh, guy who worked on special effects for i think nightmare on elm street three or four he rocks a pretty good skullet because he shows up on up. he shows up in the documentary uh, never sleep again, and he's got a skull. I'm like that guy. You're talking got a about skull. John, John Carl Buechler. No, not the guy. Who the did guy Kevin, that, not, is it Kevin Yeager? Kevin not, Yeager. Oh the, yeah, dude. I think not it is the car, not the Carnosaur guy. Beekler is the okay. Carnosaur guy, right? Carnosaur. Yeah, and he, he directed Friday the Thirteenth Part. Uh, you know where he where he fights Carrie. You know, Jason versus the psychic. Oh guy. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. Um, that's I'll have to look skullet, that one up. The uh, skull. Uh, yeah, that's Reggie Bannister from Phantasm has an awesome skull. It. Oh, and uh, the guitarist, uh, one of the guitarists from the band Saxon. <laughs> That, that's that's how far that's my skullet like rocking list. Invoking Saxon. You have a you have a spreadsheet with all the skullets listed in my there, head. Like, I think. Nice. <laughs> but no, but Buzzy is it Linhart or Linehart? I think was I think it's Line. It's probably Linehart. I uh, he I know he passed away in 2020. I, I did look that up. He's still yeah, under with us. He wrote the song Friends. That Bette he Midler he, that became like you got to have friends. Oh, okay, I can't sing like Bette Midler, but yeah, like that's huge right there. That song's massive. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he worked with Jimi Hendrix and also worked with people like Harry Nilsson, Buffy St. Marie, John Sebastian. Um, but yeah, I mean, dude, dude was legit. Um, and, and Ken we saw Shapiro. His, and Ken, I don't think that's <laughs> the one he talks about. He's like, I bet his kids are that sack. <laughs> yeah. right. no almost, the, almost the one you don't want to leave off the list frankly yeah who, who what would you brag about being like hey i have an album credit on a Jimi hendrix record or i showed my wang in the groove to play i was in the movie by Bang. the guy who directed modern problems <laughs> <laughs> God. that's it that's it right there mic drop god well, you know, here's the thing about that. This movie cost two hundred thousand dollars, and it made twenty million dollars. I know, and look, that's and yeah, that is the thing I think about this movie when you look at it as a whole. I think the thing that is successful about it is that it does ultimately feel like you're turning the TV on for an hour and a half, and then turning the TV off at the end, and that is a success that you can't take away from this, even though some of the segments don't succeed. Again. I come back to Tales from the Crypt. Most of the segments in that show don't work. Most of the episodes of that show are fucking middling to in towards the end of that show. Just a nightmare that I don't want to relive. But <laughs> you could say the same thing about any of these kinds of things. The law of averages would denote there's going to be some that are good, not a lot that are great, and not a lot that are really terrible. But most things sit in the middle. And I think that, you know, the groove tube is that for the most part. I think the things that aren't great go on for way too long is ultimately the problem. I could use more ads about Brown 25 is what I'm saying. Just a lot more shit oh. ads. I wanted, honestly, the thing I did want that they didn't do is something reoccurring throughout. Like the same ad a couple times, the same company, but for different things. Like they didn't do that. 
which I was well, they surprised. Did with, they, um, they, they, they did with Uranus, they just, the company Uranus. Right, they, but they I was expecting it like times. I was expecting it like a lot more. Like I was really expecting. Then, then Father Malone, prior to your point, it would have discredited this as something to watch because then there might have been a through line. No, I that it, that would have been fine because Amazon Women on the Moon, which we end the month <laughs> with, is the perfected version of this movie. It, oh it yeah. Will, it will make you feel like you're just watching television with somebody and they have control of the remote control. Uh, and that does have callbacks to earlier earlier stuff, but it is sketchy as you can get. Oh, my God. I love that movie so much. <laughs> yeah, that really is. You're, you're right, Father Malone. That, that really is like the, the, the most highly evolved sort of sketch comedy movie, I think, because uh, it's hard for me to think of anything that came after that that approached that kind of, um, you know, being so streamlined and, and funny. As 43. Hell. As I was saying, it's hard for me to think of anything that came after that, but it had that same level. Of, it has you know, Hugh Jackman in it, guys. How could it be that bad? Oof. Well, that's, and you know what? That's the thing. I would, I would contend this is a funnier movie than movie 43 is. Leaps and bounds funny. Well, that's saying something. Mm. A low bar. Mm. I haven't seen this movie but um i'm good just judging by what you guys it's the movie that i feel like a lot of the people that are in it hope and wish that they could leave it they would probably collectively leave it off of their credits it's kind of that notoriously bad that's the thing like i don't think anybody's leaving this off of their credits because you know we mentioned chevy chase a couple times and i think we could go around the room asking our feelings on mr chase uh i think he's good in this the bearing amount that he's in here i mean to say chevy chase is in this is really to say well, he's in two segments two yeah three yeah. those are his fingers oh in the, in the finger thing with the yeah. phone book oh, okay he's that's three that's three parts i mean the sex the finger sex <laughs> is pretty convincing <laughs> the way the legs move on the one that's being fucked is pretty good i'm not joking i'm being dead serious that's one thing he knows fucking fucking up other people that's my feeling. Chase, by the way. Oh, man. Why do we have to go there? You Woo. just buried the man. Damn. This is like his Here. roast all over again. Uh, you know, uh, okay. So I, I mentioned uh, uh, Ken Shapiro had, uh, had a theater. It's Channel One Theater. And uh, um, he and Chevy Chase was part of that. So, like, all of the original uh, films that they made for the theater were like all of the Belzer parts were Chevy Chase part. And uh, he left, uh, obviously, to go make Saturday Night Live, and Belzer took his place in that theater. So that's why uh, Belzer is all over the movie. Uh, let's talk about Belzer for a minute, shall we? Uh, because, I thought we were talking about Chevy Chase, but yeah, yeah he probably but, doesn't deserve any more time than we gave him. He, he's in it for two scenes, and two, three, three with his fingers. Uh, but Belzer, um, you know, Belzer made an entire career of basically playing Belzer, which is great because I love him. Um, but you know, Detective John Munch is just Richard Belzer. Uh, but seeing the range of characters he was cycling through here, like, made me sad that he didn't do more character work. Uh, at, you know, where he actually portrayed a character because I found him very compelling in each of, each of the guises here. Maybe not, maybe not the uh, African American oh. hooker. That, yeah, that, that, was, yeah, that, was, that was that was regrettable. Yeah, <laughs> HP, that was regrettable. It was. Yeah. I, I, that, yes. And I the was, affectation and the patois was what? <laughs> a complete fucking oof. nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> it's one thing to be in blackface, but it's another to do a patois as well. Just, I, I love I love HP. You are like the diplomatic heart <laughs> yeah. of our of, of 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 everything. That Thank is you. Well, you know, but, it, it, but it doesn't it doesn't take, you know, a diplomat to look at that and go, well, on the face of it, it's just unfunny anyway. Like it's again, it's a joke that could have been told in 15 seconds that goes on for three minutes. But I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's what are you going to do? It's blackface. It's terrible. And, and it's yeah. and it's done. But again, I, I'm not blind to the fact that it was when this was made, it wasn't as big of a deal, but it's, I can't really separate my attitude from what I'm seeing on the screen. I mean, that, that's, maybe that's my failing, but, uh, but no, it was not, uh, it, that was not good. That was, excluding that though, I do agree with um, Father Malone that, uh, you know, it was good to see so much. I wasn't expecting, you know, it's almost like a, like a two hander with, with Belzer and Ken Shapiro. I mean, they're all over this thing. Um, yeah, you know, for obvious reasons, but but Belzer is great in that. Oh, I mean, he's yeah, he's, he's great. I mean, and also, um, even though it's a small part, a movie where you can see him do something that you don't think of him uh, classically with is he's in Cafe Flesh. 
and he does a little like a little section in there and um and i had it confirmed that it was him so it's obviously his name's not in the credits because it's technically x-rated though he's not sex there's no richard bell's nudity sorry to disappoint but uh the closest i think we're ever going to get are him in those hot pants in the sex the racist sex worker scene but um (laughs) Well, Which, I, I, I mean, and he's in one of Father Malone's favorite films that I enjoy as well. He's in the uh, he plays one of the Greek gangsters at the beginning of Fletch Lips. He's so good. Put a hundred dollars wow. on halibut. <laughs> I think it's something to their scrod or something. It's Richard Belzer just doing it like a Greek, you know, greasy Greek man in the in the in the 80s, 90s, I guess. I don't know. It's just you want to see badass? Belzer. You want to see badass bills? Or check out uh, Night Shift, the Ron Howard film about the accidental pimps with his cousin Henry Winkler. Um, he he plays a, like a mob enforcer in that movie. He's fucking great in it. I mentioned that uh, he was the first celebrity I saw in Los Angeles. I also got to meet him a few times because uh, he was in a remake of a Roger Corman movie called Not of This Earth that my friend Elizabeth was starring in. So she, um, I, I begged her to to go meet him. And uh, uh, ended up having a very nice conversation with him. Ended up taping uh, that week's episode of Homicide Life on the Street because he didn't have a VCR while he was in L.A. So uh, I, I got to, he wanted to see the episode, so I got to tape that for him. There, there's my Belzer digression. He was also a big conspiracy theory guy. He, he's written like several books on different conspiracy theories about the JFK assassination and UFOs and all of this kind of stuff. A lot of people don't know that about Belzer. He was uh, very staunch in his belief around uh, beliefs around conspiracy theories, which I thought that was interesting. Was, that was the first thing I saw of him was the UFOs, JFK, and Elvis. I had that book. Uh, oh, you read that book? Okay, cool. uh, I don't know if I ever read it, but I had it, which was probably the the you know I had it and I maybe perused it at one point, but I don't know why I wouldn't have read it. But I remember having it. I mean, I remember him on the X Files. I mean, isn't he also? Is he not? The character that ties all that stuff into that weird like thing that what the hell was the show where it was like all in a dream sequence. And because he was in it and everything else, like he connects all the dots. Say what else? What the fuck I'm talking about? Or I just am I, am I, am I incanting here in some sort of I'm, weird ritual nobody knows about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm so rusty on the X Files. So I I but it's I he plays the same it. character in the X Files that he plays in Homicide. Like oh, but John the... M- John Munch is in like dozens of shows. He appears. M- yeah, if there's an actual multiverse, John Munch is at the center of it. He he appears <laughs> in Homicide. He appeared on like uh, three or four different Law and Orders. Uh, if any crossover shows happen during that, I think uh, at the what CSI, John Munch appeared on that. Are, are you getting in a particular John Munch crossover that uh, that I'm not mentioning? It's the Tommy here, Westfall or? thing. What's the show? It. Saint Elsewhere. Oh. Oh my oh, God. Yeah. There is something about Belzer connected to that show that then means any show that he's been on is therefore in that fucking Saint Elsewhere kid's mind. Hmm. That's what it is. And I forget, but it is. It's Belzer is the kind of entire connection um oh did like one of those characters from saint elsewhere appear in an episode with john munch and some other show and they were like this is that character so then that means that saint elsewhere is also connected to john munch that is, is that one of the thing is that is yes it yes because he's in all these things that those are therefore tangentially within the tommy westfall brain universe because yeah the entire what that entire show takes place in a child's mind. So, yeah, that's what I think of when I think of Belzer is that weird, like, X-Files connects into all these others. He's good here. I mean, you know, but it's kind of wasted, unfortunately, because I wish he was the main focus. I mean, yeah. as much as he kind of is, I kind of wish that it was anytime it was Ken Shapiro, it was just Richard Belzer. I, I think I think the Belzer could have made the Coco show thing a little funnier. My, sorry, guys. I know. No offense to my brothers, my noise junkie brothers. I love you. It wasn't funny. I can't help it. But Kinko the Clown is hilarious. Kinko. Kink. Have you never heard that song, Chris? No. I should send it to you. It's a Dr. Demento classic. But um, no, I am. Um, so are you saying that do, could there have been a crossover possibly with Richard Belzer and Jesse Ventura? <laughs> well, that's the thing. You mentioned yeah. that. 
You and you you mentioned Richard Belzer and kind of like being a, a conspiracy guy. Like that's who I think of when I think of like contemporary people. Is the is the body Ventura? The body. The body. Was, that's what I think of. I mean, that is what I think of when I think of people like that. But I mean, he's in that same weird vein of like a. I mean, a, a personality. I don't know. Belzer's a Belzer's a weird a weird guy because he had a lot of interests in things that you don't see a lot of other celebrities coming out and talking about like conspiracy theories. So it's fighting the good fight for the rest of us who were just in, you know, interested in it, but couldn't, you know, be as kind of open about it, writing books and stuff. So yeah. ever, uh, ever see his wife, Harley McBride, Belzer's wife. Oh God, I forgot he was married to her. She was in young, was it young lady, young lady Chatterley, Chatterley too? Young lady Chatterley and the young lady Chatterley too, which speaking of like forbidden fruit videotapes, I, as a, a young a pervy child, you know, well, yeah, not child, but let's just say of an age, uh, I videotape Young Lady Chatterley too off of Cinemax, Skinemax, and mm -hmm. and then not being the brightest of children, actually wrote on the label. You know, oh no! Chatterley too, and then one day came home to my mother with a videotape. Like, you want to talk about this? <laughs> oh man. That's rough. Oof. Oh. Anyway, I, I love Harley McBride. Uh, she's beautiful and uh, talented. And, uh, you know, married to the Bells. The Bells. All roads lead to the Bells. I tried watching two as a kid, not just for the obvious reasons, but Oliver Reed, I believe, is in it. And I was already, like, super in love with Oliver Reed because of Burnt Offerings and Tommy. Sorry, this does is he, probably does a he, cycle. Does he, show this... his, does he show his special tattoo in that movie? No. What a shame. Well, I didn't get to see all of it, but I've I've read about it. I was like, this it's movie got isn't claws good. Claws on it. Isn't that amazing? He had a a nad tat. I know. It's not a nad tat. He had a dick tat. He had a I tattoo was, on the I head thought of his. It's oh, on no. the head. It was on his balls for some. It's on, on his, his penis. It's on it's, the head of his dick. That's like the most sensitive. Oh Jesus. yes. Oof. Yeah. Flynn. Oliver Reed was a fucking talons plural. Yeah, he had two talons on the head of his dick. <laughs> Don't you love Oliver Reed that much more now? I love him. You know what? This discussion tonight is funnier than the entirety of the group. <laughs> I mean, that, I, you know, that is that is kind of the sad thing, I think, for me about something like this is like, I see where they were going. But I just I I see where they were going. But again, like I said, like, I, I, I can't fault this movie for being more or less successful with some parts that don't work. Because, like, I mean, talk about SNL in its entirety. Like, how much of that show still works anymore? Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, SNL. And I mean, even I know, the I, yeah. entirety, uh, in its entirety, very little. Right. You know, we've we've been fed a diet of best of SNLs for the past 50 years. And so like the best of Twilight Zones, like the best of Night Gallery or Tales from the Crypt, like there's a lot of chaff in that weed. If you go back and watch early Saturday Night Live, uh, first, second, third, season, there are sketches that are like 17 minutes long and it's just character pieces. There are no jokes specifically. They go on and on and on. So, uh, you know. I, I can't blame this movie for not being funnier. Like maybe had he had a few more writers involved, it could have been, but, uh, right. But and yeah. that's, well, that's the other thing. It seems this movie, as much as it is written by three people, it definitely feels like one person's specific voice, Ken Shapiro's voice, which I think to your point, Heather, I, I would err on the side of my comedy expectations don't necessarily see eye to eye with Ken Shapiro's and, and that's okay. But I think the problem is it's so much Ken Shapiro and him, 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 that if there were another voice or two in there to maybe, you know, like with Tarantino where he has an editor who can trim his stuff down, it would help if there were other people to diffuse Ken Shapiro's stuff just a little bit so that it's not just so overwhelmingly his comedic sensibilities, which I don't necessarily vibe with a whole lot. Yeah, agreed. Oh, it hits me. I never got to mention the second, um, like, a, a, like erotic film actress. I feel like very saucy. It's a very saucy episode tonight. Because uh, uh, Rebecca Brooke is the actress in the Sex Olympics section, which wasn't good. But she's in Radley Metzger's The Image. And Riley Metzger is an auteur down, down boots. I, nobody can see this listening to this, but I have a small black and white picture behind me underneath my uh, badass 
Dark Shadows French poster. <laughs> and it's Radley Metzger. Radley Metzger is a brilliant filmmaker, and I highly encourage it. She was amazing in the image. Great actress. I, it may be sad because she was in one of the worst segments. That one went on way too long. It wasn't funny. Um, she's a great actress, though. So props to Rebecca Brooke, a.k.a. Mary Mentum. I mean, the joke, it's like they do the same joke four times. Yeah. It's like, yeah. how many times do you have to do the same joke? I didn't get it. Like, you know, there is something to be said for repetition, right? You know, repeat it four times. And on the fifth time, it's funny. Or three times and the fourth time, it's funny. But not always. No, yeah, not it's, always. It's, it's, there has it's to a be a joke roll. in there that is more than just, <laughs> hey, remember that commercial you just heard on the radio for the third or fourth time? See, you, you, you've seen this ad? Well, we've seen that ad. I do like a little bit of physical comedy with the I'm looking over a four leaf clover. That may be my favorite segment in the entire movie. It's pretty great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's got Chevy Chase doing nothing, just sitting there, singing, and then the other guy playing on his head. So, yeah, that was Chevy cute. Chase getting smacked around. Who doesn't yeah, like that? Which is oh. funny. Oh, like, I mean, right? I, I mean, yeah, like, I, I mean, <laughs> again, not to drag the guy, but it sounds like he does a pretty good job dragging himself on his own. Oh, so. my God. I mean, like, I don't know, like, the problem with someone like Chevy Chase is, like, I, I, he's in one of my favorite movies of all time. He's fucking Fletch. I mean, John Hamm is Fletch, but for me, Chevy Chase is Fletch. Fletch is a a character that was a very important character for me at a formative part of my life. So it's hard for me to overlook the fact that I love Chevy Chase, but he is not a person that sounds like he does a lot to make people like him. And that's hard to grapple with when he plays such kind of charismatic characters and comes off as a guy who you would like to be around. But then you hear the story about him and Bill Murray trying to fucking kill each other. And it's like, you know, I know Bill Murray ain't exactly a pip either, but I don't know. Like Chevy Chase just doesn't do a lot, in my opinion, to help the case that he's perceived as someone that people might not want to work with. OK, let me address that. That that situation was Chevy Chase had become the big star of Saturday Night Live and left the show. And then he was coming back to host it. Mm-hmm. And Belushi could not stand that fact. So he was stoking fires between Chevy Chase and Bill Murray all week, which culminated in Bill Murray saying to Chevy Chase, why don't you go back home and fuck your wife? I hear she needs it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny. But the, the thing I like best about that story, though, is, is when they were getting pulled apart, Bill Murray's insult to Chevy Chase was calling him a medium talent. Which, <laughs> oh, my God. For somebody of Chevy Chase's <laughs> considerable ego, has got to be it's got to hurt. You know, I love what that. a great line. I call people so that good. all the time now. Medium talent. It's the worst insult you could ever level at a performer. You're fucking mid, bro. Yeah. That's ju- I mean, that is just that what hurt. that I mean. That cuts. That yeah. Cuts. That, yeah. That's, I mean, that's why people are getting all bent out of shape when that guy on Twitter was like, Margot Robbie's mid, bro. It's like, are, are you fuck? Are you fucking fucking right now? Like Chevy Chase, I don't think is a medium talent. But yeah, his oh, boy, you know, that burned his ass. Oh, yeah. he, th- he still thinks about that. You know My, he does. He forgot immediately, go fuck your wife. You can't satisfy her. That was that went in one ear and went out the other. Medium talent, he's still... <laughs> he, when he wakes up in the morning, medium talent. I wasn't in Ghostbusters Afterlife. I'm a fucking medium talent. <laughs> As Bill Murray cashes his fucking checks. No, I, 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 have a, I have a hard time really coming to terms with Chevy Chase, the human being, and Chevy Chase, the artiste or the comedian, because... I don't know. Comedy is such a intrinsically linked to who the person is thing versus like horror or action movies. Like who cares what Arnold Schwarzenegger's like? He can portray a charismatic guy on screen. So we kind of don't care what he does. It's nice that he's kind of seemingly for the most part, uh, well put together but like being a comedian it's like kind of intrinsically tied to who you are so that's why it's hard for me to like chevy chase just i don't know he's a real problematic and not problematic but he's regrettable in a lot of ways as hp would say <laughs> i love I, hp saying regrettable is like he is thing. regrettable that he makes way, regrettable so decisions much. you mentioned community heather he got thrown off that show because he was being an asshole yeah and that was that was like what a lifeline that show was to him right. because he hadn't he had he was nowhere and they gave him like I, it, it's probably at this point it's like a third or fourth lifeline in his career and he again what he does is he, his ego uh, can't can allow other people to take credit for these successes and he's just such a such an asshole that he just can't let it lie and 
there he goes. He burned. He's no bridges left with with uh, Chevy Chase. He's burned them all. You yeah. know, and and and, it, and it's a shame because I grew up really. I mean, I you know, seeing him in Caddyshack and movies like Foul Play, uh, he was he was fantastic. He had it all, and he just fucked it all up. Classic case. He was going to be our Cary Grant, and then he decided that he was Cary Grant, and that he was better than Cary Grant. And everyone should shut yeah. the fuck up because he invented comedy. Right. And, and now he's in the very excellent Mr. Dundee, a Crocodile Dundee movie that I didn't know existed. Well. Wait, is Paul Hogan in that? Yeah. it's uh, it, it came out in is 2020, he... and it's uh, Paul Hogan is reluctantly thrust back into the spotlight as he desperately attempts to restore his sullied reputation on the eve of being knighted. I thought this was a Crocodile Dundee movie. Apparently it's not. Is Paul Hogan in it? Bite your tongue. How can you have a crocodile Dundee movie with no Paul Hogan? Paul Hogan playing a character like 80, named though? Paul. I, he... I gotta say, I gotta break in for a minute. This is this has nothing to do with anything. This just triggered a memory of Father Malone and I. He probably doesn't remember this. We were standing in line waiting to see the very first Batman movie. Do you remember this, Father Malone? I and remember the, the day. The guy in front the guy in front of us was just some guy in Revere or whatever, Massachusetts, but he had like a crocodile dundee type hat on his head. And the whole time we're shuffling through this line, Father Malone is throwing like backhand he's saying that's not a knife that's like he's all these quotes these <laughs> crocodile dundee quotes mocking this guy mercilessly as we're waiting in line oh my god it was so fucking funny do you remember that yeah <laughs> that was like something you would do even if you didn't say, remember doing it that is on brand i love it that is hilarious oh my 16 god years old. 16 you scamp yeah I, you can uh, you can actually date that moment. We're like Marilu Henner here. Uh, you know, you can you can look what whatever the opening day of, of Batman was was the day that I was mercilessly mocking some poor man <laughs> and his, his what he thought was a cool fashion choice. It's making me laugh all these years later. Just the memory <laughs> of it because you were just so fucking funny. At just just mercilessly met, you know getting on this guy's case. It was hilarious. Anyway. Apparently, this is a movie, though, and uh, it's it sounds great. It's got Paul Hogan. It's got Chevy Chase playing a person named Chevy. It's got John Cleese playing a character named John. It's got Olivia Newton-John in her final screen role playing oh. a character. Yeah, boy. And that's when it got depressing. This um, is sad. Yeah, the I last like thing this. Chevy Chase was in that was like of big note was when he played Clark Griswold again in Vacation in 2015. And you know what? I rewatched that movie recently and I actually think that movie is really funny because it's really mean in a way that like the mid aughts comedies are kind of mercilessly mean to the main characters in a way that the original vacation kind of was just mean to the main characters. It goes way further and I, I kind of can't fault it. And Ed Helm, Ed Helms plays a really funny version of a character that is effectively just what Chevy Chase was doing. But Ed Helms is actually like a likable person, <laughs> seemingly <laughs> unlike Chevy Chase, it which is the problem. Anthony Michael Hall. Come on. Do what? It should have been Anthony Michael Hall. Sure. It sh or, or it should or it should have been oh, um, yeah. Johnny Galecki. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it could have been any of that. You could have made the case. It should have been any of them. But my point is like. That's the last thing Chevy Chase did of note. And that was well, eight years ago. So, you know, though, I mean, you guys talking about Chevy Chase and, and that whole like separating art from artists. How do you think I feel when Randy Quaid was my favorite? OK, because that cheese went off the cracker. He could yeah. still be your favorite. Yeah, like that. Talk about on brand. That's just cousin Eddie. No, it's tall. No, no, no. <laughs> that's no, Elijah C. Scuggs. No, no. I wish. I it wish. Is <laughs> I mean, look. Isn't that Randy so good? Hasn't Randy Quaid so turned good. a corner? Like I saw no. him with Alex Winters signing autographs at something. Like, are you serious? I, I yes, I think Randy Quaid has turned a corner. I mean, if like he's so, that would make me so happy because I legit I love Randy Quaid. I think he's a fucking awesome actor and he can do dramatic and comedic he can do everything like he's so underrated and so i i that would make me happy because you know mental illness is real and you can't help that and i hope like i hope he's in a better place legit i thought randy he was living quaid. in a room randy what quaid agreed with me on twitter so it's good we're good oh boy good. <laughs> your fiddle your fiddle That's your a, fiddle yeah fiddle, fiddle we're fiddling good. all right let's get the fuck out of town with randy quaid 
Your fiddle, uh, the fiddle, fiddle. That was so good, fiddle, Chris. Fiddle, fiddle, fiddle. <laughs> I mean, hey, I hope Randy Quaid's turned a corner because. Yeah, seriously. Tevi Chase, like, I, I, to me, like, he, even when he was likable, he was still kind of playing characters that were kind of assholes a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so, like Fletch. Chase. That's why we yeah, like him. Yeah, exactly. Fletch. So I I'm, mean, that's, Fletch is like a distillation of Chevy Chase for me. Like, that's not, that's not the character in the book. That's Chevy Chase. Like, that's. When I read the books, finally, I realized like it's not that's not the character in the book. That's just Chevy Chase being Chevy Chase. And yeah. then Fletch Lives is just him being Chevy Chase some more. Like, exactly. they, I mean, he's like Will Ferrell. Like there are other comedians that came from SNL that were such big personalities. It's like I want to cast a movie because of who you are, not like I mean, yeah, Will Ferrell's funny and Chevy Chase is funny, but it's like th- who they are brings more through the door than a specific character that they're going to do. Like Jim Carrey, right? Like, yeah, I can say that. I mean, Ace Ventura, right? That's yeah. I mean, I every love- time you watch a movie with Jim Carrey, you know what you're going to get because it's always Jim Carrey kind of doing the Jim Carrey thing, at least in the '90s. And Chevy Chase is the same thing. Like you knew what, like you said, Father Moon, you knew what you were going to get because he's kind of just playing himself. And when he stopped playing, when people stopped resonating with him playing himself, it's when everybody stopped caring, which was pretty much the 90s. And that's when every studio was excited because they didn't have to be in the Chevy Chase business anymore. <laughs> they didn't have to make nothing but trouble, baby. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that movie. That is the movie where I realized even Chevy Chase can't save something like this. It's a good movie. I know you like it. It's 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 a one time trip inside of the the mind of Dan Aykroyd. Oh, yeah, I had the same, I, world's the same, same song. Come on, everybody. I, I, I had the same. Two oh, is in I that heard movie, that y'all. Song. I have not heard that. But see, song I, I felt the same years. way, Chris. When I when I saw Modern Problems, that's I mean, all the way back then, I knew that there was nothing going to save that movie, not the least of which was Chevy Chase. And it's just you know, I I, I guess my the the. Uh, I, I came to that realization much, much earlier. I mean, because he made some real do- real bad, oh, heavenly dog. I mean, this is not, to say, not a peerless. Did you stop yourself peerless... from saying dog shit? Well, because <laughs> I was going to segue into oh, heavenly dog. I didn't want to say dog twice. Oh, oh heavenly dog, dog shit. shit. I have I have yet to see that movie. I've, I've wanted to see it for the longest time. Do yourself a favor. <laughs> oh, right. man. Run, don't walk. Oh, <laughs> heavenly dog. Yeah. God. Have you seen I, Under the Rainbow? I actually like Under the Rainbow. I do yeah, too. I'm I'm recommending it right now. Yeah. I have not, but I know what it's about. It's got little Billy Barty in it. It oh does and Carrie Fisher as well. It's uh it's a romp. I mean, it's probably terrible. I haven't seen it in forty years. So I'm sure it's <laughs> garbage. But I remember it being very, very good. <laughs> yeah. Soon coming to the Weirding Way Media Network, the Chevcast. All Chevy all the time. Hmm. <laughs> Boy, I feel like we'd get one listener in the town wherever Chevy Chase is. Oh, I mean, it's like the Steven Seagal thing. It's, me. I mean, but the problem is he makes himself an easy target. But see, I feel like Seagal, I don't know. It's like Chevy Chase at least hasn't been accused of like sexually harassing women, to my knowledge. I don't fair. Say that. That's fair. Or, or being abusive. Like he's, a, he's, is he egotistical? Obviously, undoubtedly. Is he an asshole? Sure. I feel like saying egotistical asshole, you could throw a stone in Hollywood and you're going to hit one of them. You know, the difference is it's like when you stop making that much money. Yeah. For the that, indus- you know, the like industry the, turns on. Yeah. I mean, the industry made that monster and he didn't help, obviously. But, you know, I don't know. I because I, there are artists I love who have who have done slightly criminal things. <laughs> like, so I'm just like, I'm a little more lenient, I guess, with, with Chevy. My, my hey, thing no. is like, don't don't date them. Don't hang out with them. Right. I wouldn't want to be his friend. You know? Like, I you mean, know, the thing about Chevy Chase is, uh, you know, his his reputation is is probably well one and uh the fact that it's an extension of the character that we all like is kind of funny to me that like you know uh we love this asshole like it turns out he's an asshole though like whoa. right oh, who'd okay. have thunk it yeah the other thing about chevy chase is uh, a lot of the of, of what is actually important about him in the comedy world we don't see that uh, him helping with the structure of saturday night live is very very important um, his sensibility, and he was the head writer on that show for that first year. So, um, you know, uh, and and what you saw is what we got. And and before SNL, like you know, he was on, um, you know, he was in Lemmings, the the stage show, the National Lampoon show, and oh, he was on the radio show a lot. He's, like, he's amazing in that. 
Amazing in Lemmings. He's incredible in Lemmings. So uh, one there's of the a- best jokes in SNL history. I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. I mean, that that I mean, that's that alone like that. That says it all right. Well, for, certainly for him. Right. I mean, Weekend Update exists because of Chevy Chase in a lot of ways. Like it, it isn't often someone can sum themselves up in one phrase. Right. But I'm Chevy Chase and you're not pretty much does it. Right. And and, and that's and, and in, in so many ways, in every way. And what's weird is like he's such a small part of this movie, right? It is kind yeah, of strange, but, ultimately. But we get to see him in that period when he was actually vital and important. More yeah. so than his appearances in the 1980s in whatever comedy. He was just sort of, you know, making better because he is a very talented and funny human being. Yeah. The vehicles that he was. Yeah, I have utmost respect for Chevy Chase as a comedian. It's just the the, the human being and the, and the actor. <laughs> <laughs> everything everything except for his talent uh is is reprehensible but he he I, it's hard to and i'm i'm only half being facetious there but to father malone's point i mean he 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 was an important part of what made those early years of snl go he's a phenomenally talented guy he was good looking this was a unique package i mean unfortunately in, in his later years he kind of became like the new version of milton burrell this guy who thought Ugh. that he was God's gift to comedy, who, you know, invented comedy as, as we know it and so on and so forth. And the fact is, he, he really didn't. And it's sad. But uh, but no, I none of this is to take anything away from his his comedic contributions, especially in the 70s and 80s. Well, we all really know what Milton was. Shut the fuck up, Chris. I'm sorry. HP HP was being so eloquent. And it would have been hard it. not to walk right into and, it, though. And all I could see, well, well, speaking of walking into it, was while well, our my my noise junkies brother here is being eloquent. Chris is like making like dick dick hand gestures as soon as you mentioned Milton Berle because me, me, me and him have talked about this Uncle Milton no, but, uh, I, everyone knows Uncle Milty was was packing I mean that's, that's you know that that's that's just like um, <laughs> Uncle Milty was packing put that one on his shirt folks I, I mean you know there's a lot of interesting uh, quirks and legends around the, the Hollywood who's the Marlo Thomas is Danny Thomas there's a lot of interesting rumors about his proclivities we won't go into those here but, it involves uh, the coffee table a glass yeah. coffee table. <laughs> oh crap Thank Ew. you, Father Malone. He's a glass oh, bottom he does. And, and I, when pre- when pressed, apparently his I don't know if it's his lawyer or the executive of his estate. When asked about that, he he, he responded by saying the man built hospitals. That's which not a denial. To me, says true. Mil- Milton Berle was in a rat video. He didn't build no hospitals. I just don't want to think about Milton Berle having a schlong period, much less a big old hog leg. Like that <laughs> Milton Berle? Gross. Like, you think th- when he th- got older, he could use it like a cane? Oh, nasty. Nasty, Chris. I don't like Call it. Call him Tripod. <laughs> Wasn't that one of the only uh, episodes uh, of SNL that they don't repeat? Because he guest hosted yeah. in the 70s, and he was such a terrible host. And a terrible host. Like, he, he insisted on, on singing a song. Which they didn't. <laughs> okay, and, that's funny. <laughs> and hammed it up everything. It, it, I, I wish they would re-air it because it, it it involves one of my favorite moments ever, which is Bill Murray had figured out what this old vaudevillian was doing in every sketch and uh, noticed Burl going like to the back of the stage so that when he was introduced, he would walk up like all the way from back of the camera to the foreground. So your attention would be on him the entire time. So Bill Murray would constantly move his body in front of him in the camera so that you didn't <laughs> see him at all. Oh, that's Which a power move. Apparently really like angered Milton Burrow uh, in the scene. I love that. Could feel, um, you know, Bill at some point could probably feel milk coming from at least a foot away. That's disgusting. <laughs> Ew, Chris. <laughs> I would rather hear about Danny Thomas's glass bottom boat. What is it? Well, I have I've never oh. heard this rumor. Is this talking about oh, someone okay. shitting on a table? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Man. Alleg- allegedly Sylvester Stallone's also into that. Allegedly. allegedly. You know what? If if normal people are into it, which normal people are, that means that there's got to be people in the industry that are well known that are into it. I just think I imagine that's just like being jaded. Like you, you know, it's like that that aqua teen where Carl's <laughs> Carl's watching internet porn and he goes, I am so jaded. I mean, it, it's got to be completely bananas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they gave, you know what? They know what they were doing. They gave Chevy Chase his own late night talk show in the mid 90s. You guys remember oh, that? It was so good. I watched it when it was on. 
It was yeah. it was so unfunny. You know when your show is good when it can be some the run can be summed up in how many weeks it was on. I forgot about that. I actually knew a writer on that show when I was living in Los Angeles who told me um, Chevy's entire idea for a joke is <clears throat> I'm wearing a microphone and then someone calls me out of the room and I forget the mic is on and then you listen to me pee for a really long time. <laughs> what, like, he watch that, Naked Gun one too many times. He said like to the, to to Chevy, but like to the writers, like that was the that was the pinnacle of Chase humor. God, wow. You know, he sounds like Vincent Kennedy McMahon. (laughs) I love hearing people piss. I mean, what the what the the fuck happened to Chevy Chase in those thirty years or twenty years where he was on SNL to become that? Well, that wasn't that long because he was in that the the talk show was what like ninety two ninety three ninety three yeah so seventeen years what happened in those seventeen years the 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 movie career ended basically yeah that's fair and hey originally that show was supposed to be hosted by Dolly Parton anyways so you know it's not like they gave Chevy Chase a show (laughs) they gave him the show Dolly Parton passed on so interesting yeah that's yeah (laughs) which speaking of television the movie Groove Tube which is a parody of television. Very of good. a specific time and place. <laughs> is that is that the ultimate problem with this movie? Is it's not timeless enough to be important? It's not funny enough to be. But I, I, no, I, that's, that's, that's shitty. Fine. I, I don't. That's mean, fine. I don't, I mean, to, that's, I don't know. Neither I don't here mean to be mean. Overly just, negative Heather, folks. I like no, this version of Heather. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just. I mean, this about Heather's called... paying. Heather's paying the universe back for how mean Jess was on Barfly. <laughs> You can feel that, that reverberating episode. through the, the audio so sphere. For, for anybody listening, and, and you got mad listening to the Barfly, I love Barfly, and Mickey works amazing in it. Yeah, but anywho, yeah. Seconded. No, I, I, huh? Seconded. Thank you. No, I mean, I think the Groove Tube does have strengths to it. I think it's an interesting film, but the thing is, like, with comedy especially, for people, for it to have that beloved place... It has to have a rewatchability factor. It has to be really f- funny. I mean, like the jokes have to land. I don't, I'm not saying it's a, I've seen way worse movies and I've seen way worse comedies. That is for for sure. But, you know, I think, I think this is something I think you might've said earlier, Father Moon, like it's a great curio. Ultimately, um, it curios have their place. Like, so that's not, I don't mean it's later. It's just, it's not, it's less funny than it, it is funny. And that's the problem with comedy. Kentucky Fred movie still talked about to this day because it's still funny. It's just a funny movie. So in my opinion, obviously comedy is subjective, but. But does Kentucky Fried movie have a talking cock? You know, but I, you know, that's the thing. I saw an adult film that did that earlier and they put googly eyes on that dick. Googly eyes. It, 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 honestly, it just, re- it, re- re- it reminded me of, uh, it reminded me of some of the segments in Jackass. I was expecting a scorpion to come in from off screen and start stinging the penis. It was that uh, Shapiro's. Was that Shapiro's nad? I'm sure it was. I, I don't know now. who's. Did, they never. They didn't say. You know what? I can guarantee you whose it wasn't. Chevy Chase. Probably not. Or or Milton Berle. <laughs> Let's wait now. <laughs> if it was Milton Berle, that it wouldn't need a body. It would just. It would have a body. It would have a face. It would have feet. <laughs> God, Mil- <laughs> Milton Berle. Feet. Every it, time it, his it, name gets brought up, it's like we're in we're closer and closer to invoking him back to life. This is the remake of Candy Bandit. <laughs> milty, 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 and then you it's hear Uncle him. Milty. He knocks on the door before he even gets to it. Oh my Christ. god! That's <laughs> HB. I'm going to kick it to you first. Final thoughts on the Groove Dude. Uh, so to kind of piggyback on what you were saying earlier, I. I it, yes, it, it wasn't it wasn't especially funny, especially to a modern viewer. But but what makes me happy is that I, I'm happy that it's it's preserved. Like I'm happy that I got a chance to see it, that it still exists as a as a thing. As we've used this word several times already, as a curio of that time and place. So I I'm I'm happy that it's there for me to see. I don't know that I'll revisit it anytime soon, if at all. But um, no, it's not the funniest. Thing I've ever seen, or not even close, but it was it was a, a a good experience to see it and kind of feel the spirit of what they were trying to accomplish, even if they missed the mark more than they hit the mark. But but I was happy to have the opportunity to finally see it after wondering about the movie for you know decades. So yeah, Heather, what about you? Um, I mean, 
Like you probably guess. <laughs> no, I think I I agree with everything HP said. I and uh, there's not really much I could add to that. I do think I I do think it. I think all films should be preserved. I think it definitely has an important historic place in comedic cinema and in culture. Um, I I'm good as far as revisiting it. I I yeah. but it it is neat to see the genesis of anything, and it's uh it's great to see. Belzer, you know, the Bells, come on. I mean, I love Chase, but Richard Belzer is just, to me, just one of the coolest ever RIP. So those are my final I'll give my final thoughts and then Father Malone, I'll, I'll let you take us home since it is uh, is since it is your month, Ezra. Um, you know, again, I, I think I agree. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to agree with whatever you're going to say, Father Malone, obviously, but HP and Heather I echo both of y'all as well. I think in a lot of ways... It's, it is important to have historical context for things that, again, I mean, the the good night and have a pleasant tomorrow, That's a, that ends up being a weekend update thing in SNL. And it's it's here. So even if it's just that, like you like we've already mentioned, SNL is coming up on its 50th year. This is an important part of that story. And if that story is something that you're interested in, which... I mean, it. you should because SNL is the preeminent sketch TV show ever, I think. I mean, again, Heather, to your point, there are other things. But when we talk sketch comedy, SNL comes to mind because it's been around for so long. And, and even if it's not as hard hitting as it used to be, I mean, even something that I've, I'm obsessed with in a lot of ways, similarly to you, Father Malone, The Simpsons for me is that in a lot of ways. I grew up with it. I watched it a lot as a kid. It was on when my parents were holding me when I was a child, like that same evening I was born. Like The Simpsons are, is intrinsically linked with me the same way SNL, I think, is is linked with at least some of y'all. So I understand the diminishing ter- returns thing. But similarly to watching stuff from the Tracy Ullman show to see those early Simpsons sketches, to see this in a similar way, like you mentioned, Heather, to see the genesis of SNL and part of the big comedic talent that would be Chevy Chase is important. And do all the jokes land? No. But, you know, again, we're not talking about this movie in a wider audience because it they because they don't. So that's that's the reality. It's it's an interesting curio. But yeah, it, for me, that's kind of that's not all of it, but it's not much more than that. So Father Malone, I'll let you uh, bring us home. I think with uh, anything as niche as this film is, uh, I can't outright recommend it to anyone but completists and, uh, you know, uh, historians, basically. If you're interested in this time and place, if you're interested in this group of people and their place in history, in comedy history, American comedy history, uh, you you can't help but not at least see this once. Um, if I were to recommend this to literally anyone else, uh, I, I would say, actually, don't watch the movie. Uh, here's the thing. There are 18 sketches in that movie, and I think six of them work. That's one third, which is about the average for any anthology show or sketch comedy show in general. Uh, I don't think they work laugh out loud funny. And like I said, I, I, uh, to a modern person who had no knowledge of any of these people or any of the setup or why it would be historically beneficial for them to view it uh i i I could not i I would not tell them to waste their time i would tell them to watch the just you just me sequence on youtube because i do think that is joyous and wonderful and i it it actually makes me smile like uh uh not anything makes me laugh out loud in this movie in the rewatch but that still makes me smile so I would recommend it on the, on that regard. Uh, I think all of the charms, what I found intriguing about it as as a as a lad, are all gone. All of those cows, those sacred cows, have been slaughtered by now, uh, and uh, not much of it works. But uh, still recommending it for the the freakazoid film fans out there who who uh, don't know about it or uh, uh, want want to see uh, where a lot of our future comedy came from. Yeah. So on that note, we'll uh, we'll take a break and we'll play a preview for next week's episode. Award-winning motion picture producer Samuel L. Bronkowitz. I have spent a lifetime in the motion picture industry. Now, after 50 years in Hollywood, I have finally produced what I feel is the finest motion picture ever made. I have called it the Kentucky Fried Movie. The Kentucky Fried movie heralds the return to traditional values. I'm not wearing any pants. 
Film at 11. It is a film of heartfelt passion, a great love story. Oh, take me to the drive and prove you love me. <laughs> it explores the subtle nuances of interpersonal relationships. <laughs> of course, there are occasional moments of comic relief. <laughs> the Kentucky Fried Movie is a film that demands the greatest performances from the finest actors of the cinema. Hey, look, Roy. Roy. I tell you, this building is unsafe. Cities and flames, the National Guard is powerless to deal with the situation. Governor, what are we going to do? An anticipated 10% price hike across the board on petroleum products. Ah! I invite every man, woman, and child to share with me the joy and warmth of the Kentucky Fried Movie. It will knock your socks off. That's right. On next week's episode, we're going to be talking about a movie that I have never seen, just like this one. It's Kentucky Fried Movie, which I feel like I should have seen at some point. I'm glad I haven't. It's a fresh I'm, you, watch. You did a you did a podcast about the fucking suckers, didn't you? I sure did, but that was not part of it. Yeah. We did uh, Top Secret instead. Oh, well, that's Cena. You know. Which I had also never seen. So. It's a good one. So, yeah. So, uh, we'll be doing a Kentucky Fried Movie on the next episode. So, until then, where can people find you, HP? Well, uh, you can find me. Uh, I'm proud to be on the Weirding Way Network. Uh, you can hear me and Father Malone on the Night Mr. Walters Taxi Podcast. Uh, you can also, we've already, this has come up several times. Uh, myself, uh, Heather Drain, and Father Malone have a podcast called Noise Junkies, which I would also encourage everybody, if you're a music fan, please check it out. And uh, hey, you can also check out, uh, I have a band camp if you'd care to hear some of my other musical nonsense. It's hpmusicplace.bandcamp.com. Please feel free to check it out. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. What about you, Heather Rain? Well, um, you can find me at my link tree, which is linktree.com slash Mondo Heather. And there you'll find my website, MondoHeather.com, my Patreon, Noise Junkie episodes. And in fact, we uh, we have one coming up that we'll be recording very soon that will be just in time for the spooky season. Very excited about that. Um, and all my other little sundry activities. Also, I also highly encourage people to check out HP's Bandcamp. He made our amazing theme song for the podcast, and he is super talented and support. And even if you don't like music, listen to our podcast because we are uh, we are amazing, and we will never lead you guys astray. And you organically brought up the career of Joe Pesci. Uh, eat out my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Hey. And the fact that hey, HB brought that up without knowing that that was a thing is the best part of that of that episode. Seriously, just, getting wonder. to hear you guys react to that made me happy. Oh my god, that was amazing! Yeah, that was, that a, was total, a miracle. A one of us, Goopa Gaba, Goopa Gaba, <laughs> your way into everybody. <laughs> uh, Father Malone, where can people find you and your assorted uh, works, your body of works, your CV? <clears throat> well, for the rest of the month, once a week, you can hear me here, I guess, on the Culture Cast, helping to curate this month of sketch comedy movies. Uh, uh, if you go to weirdingwaymedia.com, though, uh, you can hear all the shows mentioned, Noise Junkies and Night Mr. Walters. Or I also have a, a half-hour radio drama called Dark Destinations that I write and produce. And you can hear Chris and I and our man in Detroit, Mike White, from the projection booth over on Midnight Viewing, the Night Gallery podcast, which is uh, uh, a, a lot of fun. Check all of those out. It's the show where Mike lets his hair down. Which yeah, if you great. know Mike, I mean, it's impossible, but he does it. It's <laughs> <laughs> a mean, bald it's joke for, for, the, for, the, oh. for those out there that don't know Mike White. And if you don't know Mike White, shame on They do. I just don't mean, I mean, personally, they don't, they don't know fair. him. That's fair. 
<laughs> that's fair. We're gonna, we're gonna shame you for not personally knowing. <laughs> Are you personally not know my boy? What a shame! Uh, What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of Mike White, uh, you could check out a show that I do with Mike White called the Kolchak Tapes, which we're done with uh, over at WeirdingWayMedia.com. And if you want to listen to things that are still ongoing but not any more recent in the subject material you can uh, listen to uh, the life and times of captain barney miller a show about barney miller or uh, the shabby detective about colombo you know we're we, we back the blue at least the fictional blue not the real ones you know because apparently we like doing cop shows from the 70s on this network so i have no <clears throat> idea why but uh, you can find all those shows over at weirdingwaymedia.com as for this show culturecast.com patreon.com slash culturecast 5, 20, and 50 are the levels you can get in at if that's a thing you're into. Cool. If not, just like, rate, and review the show wherever you get it. Father Malone, Heather, HP, thank all three of you for joining me. And also to Father Malone for uh, starting off the month strong, I feel. Well, in conversation, if not subject matter. Yeah, but that's but that's ultimately all that matters. All right. Because we're not sitting here watching the movie, folks. We're talking about it. If you're here to hear us recount the movie, we're not yuckety yuck McFucks on the internet. <laughs> making up shit. I don't know. If you're here for a book report, you've come to the wrong place, compadre, as they would say. Uh, it. That is what they say. And uh, and as always, Father Malone, I got to ask you first, what is the porno title for this movie? You thought, I, every time you think we're not going to do it, I'm just going to do it. So uh, HP, <sighs> you've wandered into the wrong part of town. You're here for a little thing we like to call what we do every time the three of us are on the show, which is I ask them the porn parody title for the movie we just watched, which to Heather's point, I think Heather is still in the, if there was a point tally being taken Heather's uh, colon sub colon one, I think still stands out that we haven't remembered another one. So Father Malone, I'll kick it to you first. Porn parody title for The Groove 2. I guess it would be The Groove Lube. <laughs> uh, I was going to use that. Oh, oh, the gro- oh, that's a good one. It sounds gross, right? Groove sounds- Lube. Ooh. Like something a dirty beatnik would use. Yeah. <laughs> the groove like, lube is like some sort of like mineral oil that they would use in the 70s. It comes in flavors. Ugh. Like, like green apple. The, and... the container is bell bottom shaped. Yeah. The, the flavors are the flavors are cigarette and patchouli. <laughs> Disgusting. But delicious. Uh mm-hmm. since HP is a, a newbie to this, I'll uh Heather, I'll I'll kick it to you. Porn parody title for the groove tooth. Okay, I I have I, I have a healthy amount of self loathing organically, um, and I'm just going to add to that tonight. The coos tube. Oh wow! <laughs> hey, you fucking coos! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. A, dude, what fucking movie were we watching where they used... Oh, Pope of Greenwich Village. Mickey yeah. Rourke calls Daryl Hannah why a coos. Act, why are you acting like such a coos? And then she punches him right in the face. It was great. Which is the appropriate response to anybody that says totally. that to you. Yeah. So, uh, HP, your time has come in more ways time than one come. to to, yeah. to, da- to dane us with a porn parody title for The Groove 2. Ooh, I was... I The first thing I thought it was the, was the, the Groove Lube, but I can't use that. I would say maybe The Spooge Tube. <laughs> oh, wow. Even worse. The most disgusting of all so far. Yeah. Oh, well... Could be. Well... <laughs> Y'all yes. know me, y'all know me. And uh, you know, I don't know if this is one of those things where it's like I call myself a feminist, but you're not actually a feminist. I, you know, I consider myself a feminist, so I'm I'm gonna go in a different direction here. The gruel too. You know what, man? Nobody Shut knows. <laughs> Only you knew Father Malone. I don't get that. What is it? Explain I'm not, yourself. I'm out, y'all. <laughs> what is it? Explain this. Explain yourself woman cub who calls it gruel what kind that's of an online call- that's an online that's term. awful is, uh-huh. that like from, is it uh. from like 4chan is it like a bunch it's of insults <laughs> like the urban dictionary i think i mean that's bullshit that's like some ben shapiro shit where it's just wait, like, wait, ben shapiro doesn't even acknowledge it acknowledge that that can happen no 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 but like him referring <laughs> to like female wetness when he re- talked about I don't was think like, gruel like, is. I don't think gruel is a. De- I don't think gruel was created as a derogatory term. Gruel is I, fucking derogatory. But I agree dude. with you. I agree with you. That's I like agree saying, with you. That's like calling like, hey, you got some mildew. You know, it's like nasty. Gruel mildew. is nasty. <laughs> 
<laughs> a big old bowl of gruel for breakfast. That is awful. I've heard some Why? horrible things. Gruel is like gruel is like an old term for like nasty soup. Porridge. Yeah. That it's, they it's give spelled, to like spe- sad it's spelled orphans. G-R- You'll love how it's spelled too. G R U U L. I would rather I'd rather have a makeout session with Coco the clown from Coco's room than this fucking <laughs> bullshit. I hate this. See, I hate I, this. See, oh see I took us. I took Chris, us way I'm further so down. I'm disappointed in you. I'm, I'm disappointed in myself, but that's that's the note I want to leave. And this on. is coming there, from. The- I'll bring us back up. Here's what Mister Bowser said about Chevy Chase. <laughs> Let's the leave only it time- on a real low note. <laughs> the only time Chevy Chase has a funny bone in his body is when I fuck him in the ass. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> that was, and, and that was Belzer? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love him. I love Richard Belzer. That's, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. He, even, even... he also said, I've known Chevy Chase so long, I knew him when he was funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. Also, uh, well, you know that part, the gruel tube. I wish I didn't know that. Ew, Sorry. Chris. That's and the I one it. and only time I can use it because this title is just way too close. I'm going to be watching a Steven Seagal movie. I, I didn't make the turn. I know, but I'm like horrified. <laughs> it's awful. Man. What is wrong with the youth so, of today? A lot of things. Listen, if you if that's what you refer to as women's lubrication, that you don't deserve to receive any. Just saying. I and, could quote a, I, I could quote a Prince lyric right now, but I won't. And uh, I, I think <laughs> I, I think we uh, I, I think <laughs> I think we'll leave it there, folks. On on that note, we'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>